over 100,000 Brits are going to be faced with quite a difficult decision this upcoming spring, thanks to some proposed policy changes. Now, as an American abroad, I'm quite experienced with this type of thing. For instance, if you didn't know, if I ever decide to marry a non-resident alien, which is what we call non-Americans in the States, well, I have two choices. I can either tell Uncle Sam about all of my partner's earnings so she can be taxed in the country she's only been to once or twice, or I can keep that information from Uncle Sam and instead I have to suffer and be punished with higher tax rates. Now, it seems like the UK government has seen this system and gone, hmm, but how can we make it more cruel? So what exactly is this plan and how does it affect you? Well, let me give you a scenario. I'd like you to imagine a situation here. Imagine you're a British citizen, born and bred, but just Hovis, nothing too fancy. And you live up north in the small city of Doncaster, working as a secondary school teacher. It's a fulfilling job, sure. You live up there with your significant other, the love of your life, but, well, she's not perfect. For instance, she wasn't born in the UK. I know, we all make mistakes out there, and hers was being born in a different country. And you do love her with all of your heart, but recently, the UK government has actually put a price on that love, and that price is 38,700 pounds a year. Oh. Well, that's a bit high for a teacher's salary, especially where you're from, so you're currently having issues trying to figure out, well, how am I supposed to keep my partner in the country if the government is telling us that she's not going to be allowed to stay? So you start to stress about this, and then you find out, oh, my local member of parliament from Doncaster has recently told the House of Commons that people like my wife are turning my town into a ghetto. Oh. Okay. And listen, I know this is going to be a really stressful time for you, trying to figure out how you can keep the love of your life in the country, but you can rest assured knowing that, according to the Tories, this is all being done to fix the NHS. Oh, this is going to fix the NHS? Not like the, the funding issues you've kind of been gutting them for for the last 10 years? This? Migrant attacks? Okay. <laughs> when have they been wrong before? Hi, my name is Evan Edinger, a YouTuber whose entire brand is being an American immigrant living in the UK. So whenever immigration news comes up, well, I talk about it here, and this one is quite a doozy. Usually, people don't seem too fussed. I bring up this stuff, and people are like, ah, those immigrants, what are you gonna do? This time, it's also affecting the Brits, so people are actually upset this time. So the new Home Secretary, James Cleverly, has some mighty big shoes to fill. He's following behind the greats of the past, Theresa May. <laughs> Pretty Patel, Suella Braverman. It's almost like the Tories' goal with finding someone for Home Secretary is to find someone who has the absolute most dog shit opinions and just throw them in that position and see what they can come up with. And James, oh, he's gonna try and beat Suella. I don't know, Zoella? He can't beat Zoella. <laughs> Keep Zoella out of this. So Home Secretary James Cleverly has uncleverly announced a package of five measures to help stop the migration to the UK. You know, that drum that the Tories like to hit rather than, you know, actually fixing the country. Now, what are these five measures and how are they going to affect you? Well, the biggest one that I've seen reported on a lot, which scares me the most as someone who at one point was struggling to constantly find a job to stay in the country, they're increasing the minimum salary threshold for an immigrant to stay in the country from 26,200 pounds a year to 38,000 700 pounds. What? That's higher than the median income in the UK. And what it used to be was 26,200, which, you know, is still sizable, especially for your first job out of university, who is the type of migrant that I'm talking about here, because essentially what this plan is doing, first of all, is completely cutting off 90% of immigrants that come to the UK for university. Any of them that put their like little roots in, they're like, oh, I really like here, maybe I wanna contribute to society, maybe I wanna, no. It's going to be nearly impossible unless you're in a very, very specific field that pays is very highly and probably going to be in London. So much for the uh, powerhouse of the North getting a lot of new, nope, no, 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 no. And the second measure is affecting more than just the migrants, but also their partners. So before this year, if you were a British national and you were dating someone that wasn't from the UK, as long as you had a job earning 18,600 pounds a year, you could stay in love, fine, you know, can't put a price on love until you can, because that's also been raised. So similar to the example I brought up in the beginning, if you are a spouse with someone that is on the partner visa and you're currently working a job that isn't, I don't know, software engineering or something else that's making over 38,000, 700 pounds a year, well, they can't stay. Like, the number has literally doubled. And the third most significant measure in Cleverly's package revolves around the NHS. You know that national healthcare service we got that's a bit underfunded and struggling at the moment? Well, in prior times, we actually helped people join the NHS from abroad. If you were someone that had medical skills and you wanted to move to the UK with your family, you could do so. And it was under the shortage occupation list. So it was a lot easier to become a migrant working in the healthcare system rather than just in marketing or something else. They made it easier for you. Now, with one of these, 
these measures, they're going to make it a bit more of an easy decision not to choose the UK. So under this new measure, if you are not a British citizen, but you would like to work in the healthcare industry in the UK, you are no longer allowed to bring your partner or your children. So. Essentially, it's a moot point. That's not a tough decision. If you are an immigrant who has a lot of skills in the medical field and you'd like to save some British lives, well, you either got to choose to leave your family behind to be undervalued and underpaid in the UK or choose a different country where they don't force you to be separated from your family. Like I said, pretty easy decision. And it is just wild to me that this is a decision that the conservative government is saying is going to help the strain on the social services. Ah, yes, decrease the number of people even further that are working in the social services to improve social services. That's some Tory logic, Tory maths. <laughs> Cut those homeless in half. Now to put a personal spin on this, if this policy were in place when I moved here, I would not be here today. I would not have found the love of my life. I wouldn't have you know, contributed to the UK economy and been deemed exceptionally talented in my field. And you know, maybe the flat's a mess, starring Dodie and Evan. That would never been made. The flat's a mess and so are we, but you and me are as good as we can be. What a banger. Non-existent, okay? Do you want to live in that world? <laughs> Humor, coping mechanism. The truth of the matter is, the main effect this measure would have on people like myself that came to the UK to study is that we would be forced to leave. So we're basically forcing the educated, we're bringing the, the, the brightest people in that come here to study and get master's degrees, and we're forcing them out because they're low-skilled workers. All right, that's enough. So rather than beat my own drum of, this is a stupid policy, we all love beating our drums. I'm a little drummer boy. It's Christmas. I'd rather actually go through the arguments for these policies and then break them down and show you why they're not actually correct. So the big argument I've seen in favor of these policies is that by enacting this high salary threshold, we're going to be slowing the inflow of the low skilled migrants into the UK. And this will encourage employers to invest more in, you know, training and upskilling the domestic workers that we actually have. Now, to break that down a bit more, that argument is similar to saying, if we leave the EU, we could put all that money into the NHS. We won't, <laughs> but, but we could. There's, there's no reason why you can't do both. The UK can encourage their employers to train and upskill all of their employees. There's nothing stopping them from doing that. However, the other part of the argument is that we're going to stop the inflow of all of these low-skilled migrants. That's never actually been a thing. Fun fact, I have made multiple videos on this channel before about the process of migrating into the UK. And one big asterisk that people really hang up on is you have to be highly skilled. The job that I got out of university had to be a master's level degree job. That isn't low skilled, right? Like you wouldn't say that someone with a master's degree level job, that level is low skilled. No, that was already built into the system. Financial has nothing to do with it. The amount of money you make has nothing to do with the skills. It wasn't until my fourth job in the UK until I was actually able to break that 38,700 pound threshold because that's a lot of money. It's literally above the current median and anyone jumping out of university and starting with that salary? Mate, you just gotta be working in one of two fields. So I think we can agree that argument is a bit null and void, but the other similar argument I've seen made online is mostly that, well, at least now we can make sure the highest skilled migrants are coming across, which will increase the UK's productivity. Well, not really. There is not a one-to-one -one correlation between skill and how much money you earn. Is as in the earlier example, you could be a teacher that's incredibly skilled and you live somewhere up north in which, well, your salary isn't 38,700, no matter how much skill you have. So you would be kicked out. Whereas someone who's just fresh out of university and getting a job as a software engineer would make enough. They don't have that much skill yet. They've just got a degree. But under this policy, they earn enough so they can stay, whereas the teacher cannot. So it's not really a thing about skill. Get good. Even if we consider civil engineer technicians, right? Let's say someone comes to the UK to study to be a civil engineer. They spend four years, they get their degree, they're excited to get out there in the workforce and maybe fix some of the crumbling infrastructure that's currently in our society. Well, not really. You see, the median salary of a civil engineer technician is about 32K, and no employer in their right mind is going to pay someone fresh out of university 6K over the median salary for their first job as a civil engineer? Nope, not really. And so you're going to lose a lot of those people in the workforce. You're not gaining anything. No employers are going to just magically come up with uh, other British people that just happen to be in there. No, so we're literally forcing out the people in the workforce that are going to contribute to society because they don't earn enough. Just to reiterate, nothing to do with skill, everything to do with, are you in the top 25% earners? So yeah. But the biggest argument I see for this is that, well, it'll allow the Tories to hit their target of reducing migration, and this will ease the stress and pressure on the social services. Well, I mean, if you set a goal that's arbitrary going, we wanna reduce migration, and people go, why? And they go, because we want to reduce migration, you've done it. 
you will reduce migration by enacting measures to reduce migration. Doesn't matter what the effect is. Congratulations. I mean, that will work. <laughs> However, saying it's going to reduce the stress on the social services, I think I've already explained. You're going to be decreasing the number of workers that can actually enter social services to enter the healthcare system. So that's going to increase the pressure greatly. Also, I just really hate the argument I see made online by people who have never left the five mile radius around Huddersfield that immigrants are in the NHS just taking up all the services. They take up all the stuff that we pay our good tax money for and they don't give anything back. No, did you know that immigrants who have jobs, we also pay taxes just like you. We pay our national insurance as well as paying 624 pounds every single year for the immigration healthcare surcharge. So we are paying our fair share. Thank you very much. I'm saying we, even though I'm a British citizen now, but that's because this just really riles me up. Also, one of the measures introduced by this package actually increases the already steep immigration healthcare surcharge from that 624 pounds a year to a whopping 1,035 pounds a year. So to say that immigrants aren't paying their fair share for the NHS at this point is just an uneducated opinion on the topic. Do you really think the multiple junior doctor strikes we had in the beginning of this year were because, um, too many immigrants were using the NHS services and maybe not, I don't know, the underfunding of the NHS for the last 10 years. What was it the junior doctors were fighting for? I did make a video about it. I, th I think it might've been the fact they hadn't been given an effective pay raise over 10 years. Maybe it was that not the, the racist dog whistle. I mean, just looking at the data, if we look at the number of migrants that are in the UK as a percentage of the whole population, as of 2021, we're looking at around 14%, whereas 10 years ago, we'd be looking at 12.5%. That's not too large an increase. I'd say in the last 10 years, if you've been like, gosh, these white times, the NHS are getting so awful. Do you really think that small percentage of increase caused four, six, 12 hour wait times? Or do you think something more systemic is the cause? Please think about it. I feel like this is annoying because the, the type of people that are watching this video at this point, I'm preaching to the choir. You're not the type of person that goes, oh yes, we're just going to blame things on migrants, which is a very common conservative talking point, no matter what country you're in. Problems? Let's just blame the people that aren't from here. But I'm just hoping that the fact that this actually affects native born Brits as well, who have significant others or empathy, might be able to see this is something we should be talking to our members of the parliament about, especially if maybe, you happen to live in Doncaster. I brought up the example about the Doncaster member of parliament in the beginning of this video because that actually just happened this week. Nick Fletcher, the member of parliament from Don Valley, has recently said this in the House of Commons. And that house turned into an HMO. And then we have nine people who don't speak English anymore bed hopping, which is what's happening, but this is happening, and it's happening in Doncaster, and it's happening in places throughout this country, and we are turning parts of our community into a ghetto. And this is what is happening. Your little child falls over in the street, and you have to go to A&E, and you get a 12-hour waiting list. And the reason why the waiting list is so long is because people don't speak English in these places anymore. So Doncaster has just now become a ghetto, and the NHS is suffering from 12 hour wait times there due to immigrants not being able to speak English. Okay, that, that, I mean, that is something we can actually look into. All right, so according to Nick Fletcher himself, his own city is becoming a ghetto because of immigrants who don't speak English, who are just clogging up the NHS and causing 12 hour wait times. Wow, that must be quite a uniquely Doncaster problem because I don't know if the proportion of like migrants that live in the UK is like 14%, old Donnie must have something way higher. What's the proportion? Oh, okay. So the national percentage for 2021 for, you know, the UK was 14, but Doncaster is a uh, 7% that identify as non-British? Half? Uh, well, I mean, 0.9% consider themselves British and non-British. So 7.9% if we're being conservative, pun intended. All right. So you're saying that the tiny 7.9% of Doncaster's residents, they're the ones causing the massive NHS wait times? I don't know, man. If I was the MP for a constituency that constantly shows up on top 10 lists of biggest shitholes in the UK, I would also be looking desperately for some sort of scapegoat to be like, no, it's uh, the, the foreigners. You know, they're the ones that are really causing it. Otherwise, Doncaster would be, you know, a beacon of light in the UK. It would be the powerhouse of the North. Manchester be damned. Actually, Manchester's doing quite well. I bet they must have a much smaller proportion of uh, residents that are actually migrants. They're a uh, Oh, oh, they're at 31.4%. Oh, uh, well, uh, well, uh, the, the migrants must be rich, probably earning over 38,700 pounds. That, that's it. Yeah, that, that's the problem. Now, as it has been a week since the announcement, economists and others that know how to read have been quick to sound the alarm. 
But almost like taking a page out of Liz Truss's book, remember her? Announce plans, destroy and tank the UK economy, then backpedal and say those plans that were very explicit, uh, they weren't that explicit. We're doing the opposite now and then just give up. Well, Sunak and Cleverly are now backpedaling a little bit. So after dropping this huge news, they're now attempting to walk it back with comments such as, we'll clarify things shortly, and we're rethinking things, and we'll be able to tell you details as soon as we're able. More like, as soon as we make it up, because we literally do not know before we make these plans. And don't worry guys, I heard all this stuff is just clickbait. According to Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, they're not going to be separating you from your loved one if they're a migrant. They'll allow you to stay together under exceptional circumstances. <laughs> so, I like how that was asked. He's like, guys, we're not evil. There will be exceptional circumstances. We might let you date someone that's not British. <laughs> What the fuck? How is this the country that I live in? Hi, Evan Editor here. So Cleverly is now walking back his plans again, just a little bit more. After all of the outcry, he's now come out and said, do not worry, this is a forward-thinking campaign. So if you are already in the UK with your loved one who does not happen to be from the UK, you're fine, they will not be separating you. Their plan is only to separate people in the future. So after spring 2024, they'll be separating anyone that decides to date a foreign national as long as they're not rich. If they're rich, it's fine. So raise your standards a bit. But what's also really interesting is the Home Office's own Migration Advisory Committee have just released a pretty damning report analyzing this proposal and have deemed that it's probably going to be more of a net decrease in migration by about 20,000 people, not the 300,000 people that the government has just pulled out of thin air. For instance, in the report, they say that international students with dependents who have clear economic benefits would just be replaced with international students without dependents. It's not actually going to affect affect migration as much as the Tories think it will. And this is coming from the government's own experts, which clearly they're still not going to listen to. And the best part about the whole report, in my opinion, comes out of the chairman committee's mouth, who says, the only long-term sustainable solution is for the government to provide sufficient funds to enable local authorities and providers to pay care workers significantly above the minimum wage. Wow, didn't think you had to be an expert to know that. Everyone's been saying that for ages, but here we are. Please listen to your experts for once. Strong and stable. You guys remember that? That was the uh, campaign promise. You vote for the conservative party and you're gonna get a strong and stable government. Maybe by strong and stable they meant you're gonna have to have quite a strong resolve to put up with everything we do and we get our best ideas from the stables under the piles of half-eaten hay. Bit of shit. I've genuinely gotten some comments from some of my viewers saying things like, well, labor would be no better. They're both equally bad. And I think policies like this truly show how wrong a sentiment that is. I know why you'd think that though. Politicians are all pretty much shit, aren't they? We can all agree. But <laughs> policies like this, I really don't think are gonna be ones under the labor system or a better party. Let's be honest, Keir Starmer, he's not my first. He's not my second. He's not my third lover, all right? I don't want that guy at all. <sighs> he's boring as hell, dot, dot, dot. But at least he's not trying to, I don't know, separate lovers because one of them isn't born in the UK. This upcoming general election will be my first time as a British citizen legally able to vote, and I'm very excited to enact that right. Hopefully, if you also believe enough is enough with this type of nonsense and maybe the UK can finally claw itself out of this rough patch it's in, you will also be enacting your right to vote in your local elections, especially if you're a resident of Don Valley, where I've looked up this poll recently and oh, Labour have a 19.2% lead on old Nick Fletcher. Please, please let's make it so. Please vote this Muppet out of office. At least, at least, at least that. All right, it's been a long one. Tell me what your thoughts are in the comments section. If you wanna watch a video in which I talked about all the different visa paths to get citizenship, I made that recently, so go watch that. Otherwise, love to hear from you in the comments section about this one, and I will see you guys next Sunday. Goodbye.